You can sign up for weekly emails about History is Lunch over at the Snack Shelf, my new name for that feature, where you can also learn how you can support these museums through annual memberships. And remember that this Saturday at 1 p.m. in the Trustmark Community Room, journalist Michael Cotman will be with us to discuss his book Shackles from the Deep, which details the years he spent researching the origin of the Henrietta Marie, retracing the route of the slave ship, and diving to the sea floor to explore the vessel's remains. We'll have copies of the book for sale. This program is in conjunction with Spirits of the Passage, the story of the transatlantic slave trade, and admission to that special exhibit will be free throughout that day. So please join us this Saturday. Then a week from today, on Wednesday, August 7th, Lisa Howorth, author and co-founder of Oxford Square Books, will be at the Welty House signing and reading from her new book, Summerlings. On Thursday, August 15th at 7 p.m., the Old Capitol Museum is partnering with the Mississippi Library Commission for this year's Trivia Night, which is part of the lead-up to the free Mississippi Book Festival on Saturday, August 17th. That will feature U.S. Supreme Court Justice Sonia Sotomayor, author Joyce Carol Oates, Richard Ford, Natasha Trethewey, and many, many more. You can find the schedule at msbookfestival.com, and there are rack cards for it over there as well. Finally, I hope that you will join us next week for History's Lunch when Okolo Rashid will present Muslims with Christians and Jews, an exhibition of covenants and coexistence. Today, though, we are delighted to have Tom Howarth with us to present Frederick A.P. Barnard, The Man and the Observatory. Tom Howarth, FAIA, earned a BA in English at Vanderbilt University, Bachelor's of Architecture at Mississippi State University, and a Master's in Natural Resources at Virginia Tech. He has worked in architecture for 40 years and has been a registered architect for 35 years. Help me welcome Tom Howarth. Well, I'm happy to be here. I'm uh, flattered to see a, such a large crowd, although I, I suspect you, you must come here all the time. You surely didn't come here to see me. Uh, but. But Frederick Barnard is a pretty interesting character, and, and he's worth uh, hearing about. Uh, this is a version of a talk I gave at the Millsaps Arts and Lecture Series because they were looking for a companion to Robert Parker Adams. Um, hey, Bob. Uh, doing two, two uh, observatory restoration projects, and they had to go back 30 years to find another one. Um, and, and so as I began doing research, I got more intrigued uh, with uh, Frederick Barnard, the man, uh, and focused a lot of my uh, research and attention on him. Um, uh, and, you know, it, it's, it's an interesting story, and I think they both go well together. So, um, again, thank you for being here. Um, Barnard Observatory was built in 1858 and 1859. It was uh, one of the flagship buildings for the University of Mississippi, and of course, it was the brainchild of the man who was the university's third president and its first chancellor, Frederick Augustus Barnard. Let's see if I can get this going. Okay. Uh, Barnard joined the faculty in 1854 and he was recruited as a professor of mathematics and astronomy from the University of Alabama, where he had been for 17, maybe 16 years before, since 1837. He was a professor of mathematics and natural philosophy, and later chemistry and natural history at Alabama. Uh, Barnard was born in Sheffield, Massachusetts in 1809, so he was 27 or 28 when he began teaching at the University of Alabama, and he was about 45 when he came to the University of Mississippi. He had become a master of mathematics, astronomy, physics, biology, and chemistry. Uh, he was happily married. He'd been married in 1847, but he had no children. And not long before he left the University of Alabama in 1854, he had become ordained also as an Episcopal priest. So besides his interest in natural science, he was uh, a man of serious religion. Um, 
And Episcopal priests uh, were probably in short supply in North Mississippi when, in 1854. So upon his arrival in Oxford, Barnard was appointed the rector of the nascent St. Peter's Church. Uh, he led the construction of the parish's first building, their church to this day. And lore has it that Barnard prevailed upon his friend, the New York-based architect Richard Upjohn, to design the building. Uh, in fact, uh, the noted historian Thomas Hines attributed it, attributes it as an original building uh, that is uh, specifically designed. But that said, uh, Upjohn was well known for the Episcopal churches he designed. He published them heavily in periodicals that he himself published. And he had written a book in 1850 um, called rural, Upjohn's Rural Architecture, and it was a compendium of church designs, plans, sections, elevations. They were very, very thoroughly published and circulated and used to influence the, a lot of designs. So uh, I think it's to more capable historians than I to figure out exactly the authorship of Upjohn uh, on, this, on this building. Um, in any event, um, Barnard, having been ordained an Episcopal priest, was not insignificant to his becoming uh, president of the, of the University of Mississippi because the Board of Trustees was kind of equally divided but not quite equally divided. It leaned Episcopalian uh, among Episcopalians and Methodists. And I had some, uh, some fun at Millsaps talking about how much trouble he got from the Methodist side of the, of the board. Um, but Barnard's denomination was not determined by political uh, objectives. In fact, he was raised a Congregationalist he was educated at Congregationalist schools, which included Yale at the time that he was there. And um, he was philosophically against the way he was educated and uh, inclined toward a more German experimental form of education and less toward the Congregationalist uh, form of recitation as a way of, of learning. So, um, but, but when it came time for him to, well, I'm getting ahead of myself. It, it, it didn't help him to be an Episcopalian when he once wanted to teach at Yale. Um, as I said, Barnard was born in uh, 1809, uh, May 5th, in Sheffield, in western Massachusetts. He was educated first at home where uh, according, if you believe what I read, by the age of six, he was well-versed in Shakespeare and had begun studying Latin. Uh, if you see what he accomplished later, you'll give it some credence. At the age of 10, he went to live at Saratoga Springs with his grandfather, who had been Secretary of War under John Quincy Adams. He learned the printing trade, just in case he needed a trade. And he studied at Saratoga Academy and was tutored by his grandfather. By the time he finished pre-collegiate schooling in Stockbridge, Massachusetts, before he was 15, he had learned six languages. He enrolled in Yale, at Yale in 1824, the youngest in his class. And he graduated in 1828, having just turned 19. He was second in his class behind another student whose Latin recitations were better. He intended to be a lawyer. He tutored at Yale for a couple of years where he conceived and implemented the innovation of having subject area tutors. Before that, all of the tutors had been generalists and each students were assigned tutors and that tutor worked them through all of the subjects. So it was uh, Barnard's innovation that made the tutors specialists, and the students therefore got the best instruction from, uh, from essentially graduates who, who were focused on the subject that interested them the most. And it was during this period when he was 20, 21, 
that Barnard began to go deaf. And his mother had had otosclerosis, and he had inherited it. And it's progressive and incurable, and he recognized then he would never be able to practice law. He took a job teaching at a grammar school in Hartford, where two years later he published his first academic book, A Treatise on Arithmetic, in 1830, so by then, 21. Uh, his time in Hartford overlapped uh, his friend, the poet, John Greenleaf Whittier, who later in life recollected that had Barnard chosen to be a poet, he would have been better than himself. Um, he also learned American Sign Language, and after a couple of years of Hartford, he took a, uh, took a teaching position at the New York School for the Deaf and Dumb. He stayed there for five years, and he published an article in 1835, The Existing State of the Art, Instructing the Deaf and Dumb, published in the Literary and the Theological Review. And then a year later, in 1836, he published another book, The Analytic Grammar with Symbolic Illustration was a text for deaf students and it remains in print today, 183 years later. He left New York to join the faculty at the University of Alabama, and the story there is that he really wanted to go back to Yale and teach, and he was not hired because by then he had converted to Episcopalianism, and they liked the Congregationalists. Um, so, he went to the University of Alabama where the president recruited him in part because of his scientific knowledge, but also his drive. He wanted to build an observatory. And so this is the first observatory that, that Barnard designed. He arrived in 1837 and he built this observatory which was completed in 1844. It, for the main telescope, he ordered a refracting telescope with an eight inch lens, which was very uh, impressive for that time. Of course, it takes a while to get the, the telescope caught up with the building construction. So the telescope was mounted in 1849. The, this is the classroom uh, wing that was in fact added soon after Barnard left the uh, University of Alabama. But when I look at the design of this uh, tall space, uh, I think of it, it, it reminds me of what you will see later at Barnard Observatory. So uh, in my mind, I think there's a strong case to be made that before he left, he was very involved in the design of, of this, um, of this classroom edition that happened after he left. And the University of Alabama has fairly recently, that is about, well, recently, recently has a different measure from what it used to have in my mind. Um, you know, about 15 years ago, they did their own re rehabilitation of this building. And it is, uh, they named it after, uh, they named it in honor of Frederick R. Maxwell who's a consulting engineer who was influ influential in saving the antebellum buildings that remain now on the Tuscaloosa campus. Because like the University of Mississippi, the University of Alabama campus was largely burned during the Civil War. So, so Barnard stayed here until 1854 uh, while uh, and, and he was, that's when he was re, being recruited by the University of Mississippi. Um, he was a man of proven scholarship. And, and while, you know, one of the interesting things about Barnard is while he was a northerner, he was very adaptable. And when he was at the University of Alabama, not only did he, but the University of Alabama also owned slaves. Uh, and in fact, there's the records of a university-owned slave named Sam, who was one of Frederick Barnard's 
primary assistants in the laboratories doing research work. Um, but one of the reasons that Barnard left the University of Alabama is, again, he was sort of handcuffed by the pedagogical uh, strategies of the president of the, of the University of Alabama. He wanted more autonomy, more authority, and he also thought he might get a better budget at the University of Mississippi because Mississippi at that time on the, the ratio of, of wealth per capita uh, was considered the wealthiest state in the Union. But of course, human chattel, slaves, were counted on the side of, of wealth, not capita. And so after the war, when slaves moved from wealth to capita, then Mississippi became possibly and probably the poorest of the states in the, in the United States. Um, so when Barnard became president, uh, he petitioned the Board of Trustees and the state legislature to fund his larger observatory. And that's one of the things that brought him to the University of Mississippi. He, he had built his observatory in Alabama and what, he wasn't going to get another shot at it there. He was going to get another shot at the University of Mississippi and he was going to, uh, like Alexander Hamilton, not going to miss his shot. And so he, he commissioned what was to be the world's largest lens and he uh, bought a raft of other state-of-the-art scientific instruments and, and equipment. The uh, negotiations weren't easy. Barnard, in fact, had to threaten to resign, and he, in fact, was serious about that threat to resign because he inquired about jobs at Sewanee and again back at his alma mater at Yale. Uh, but ultimately, the Board of Trustees and the Mississippi legislature accommodated his request for $100,000, payable over five years. Um, and with that, Barnard Observatory was built using slave labor, and he was able to purchase many of the finest instruments of the day. And now most of those instruments are in the Millington Barnard collection at the University Museum, which I, I strongly recommend to anybody with the least geeky inclination at all. Um, it's, a, it's a remarkable collection. Um, Barnard stated his, his aspiration this, as this, that the Barnard Observatory will be my monument. So knowing that he's a man of science, that he's committed to research, you know he did his homework before he set about building the Barnard Observatory. So he, the gold standard for observatories in the mid-19th century was the Polk of a uh, Imperial Observatory at St. Petersburg. It was authorized by Tsar Nicholas I in 1827, and it was built near St. Petersburg, opening in 1839, and it had a 15-inch refracting lens, which was then the largest lens in the world. Um, Polkovo was heavily damaged in World War II, uh, and this is reconstructed after World War II, uh, but it was a center for science there. And Harvard College was a little slower getting out of the gate. They appointed a head astronomer in 1839, which was the year that Polkova's telescope was mounted, but they did not begin constructing a permanent observatory until 1844. And that was the year that Barnard completed construction of the, univer the University of Alabama uh, library, um, Observatory. And it was 1848 before Harvard uh, installed their 15-inch refractor, which was a twin to the one at Pulkova. Um, the Harvard Observatory was called Sears Tower, which is not to be confused with this <laughs> Sears Tower. Um, so these were Barnard's main precursors and exemplars. So as he set about advancing science and his university by building its 
Observatory. It, it's clear that all three of these buildings, the Imperial Observatory at Pulkova, the Sears Tower, and Barnard Observatory are similarly configured with three main pavilions, one central and two flanking ones, connected by lower linking masses. So the lower linking masses and then the other pavilions. In each building, the central pavilion is topped by a cylindrical drum or dome, which houses a main telescope, and then smaller, a smaller observatory. In the case of Pulkova, there's one on each side. In the case of Barnard and Harvard, there's one on one side, and then, and then at Barnard, you'll see, has a balancing dome on, on the east wing that was in fact never intended for a, a use as an observatory. It was just simply a classroom or a meeting room. Um, in all three of these observatories, the north and south oriented openings in one or more of the rooms that link the pavilions provide views to measure the transits of stars. So they would, oops, uh, that's exactly what you said I would do. So the, right here, you can see the windows open all the way through to the roof so that you can get a continuous transit from directly overhead to the southern horizon. And that allows uh, the measurement of time through the pa passage of the stars across the sky. Um, and the design of these three billions illustrate also how prevalent and popular the Greek revival style was in the mid 19th century across the world. Uh, before construction of the actual observatory began in 1858, Barnard commissioned his telescope uh, in 1856. And to compete with the other observatories which had 15 inch aperture telescopes, he commissioned a 19-inch refracting lens from Alvin Clark and Sons, who was the foremost optics makers of the day, at least in the United States. And at first, Clark refused to accept the commission because they were wary that Barnard's reach ex exceeded Clark's grasp. But uh, because after all, this would be the largest uh, lens uh, but Clark, after that, could, proceeded to, to cast the next four world's largest lens, lenses. So, so Barnard, Clark was already on the map, but Barnard pushed them to, to grow. Uh, and once they cast and ground the lens, they, they determined that it was perfect. Uh, that was the good news. The bad news was that the Civil War was about to start. Oh, gotten out of order here. So construction of the, of the observatory had begun in 58, completed in 59. Uh, Mississippi never completed the purchase of the world's largest telescope. They had paid a deposit. But the war began during the academic year of 1860 and 61. And when the university failed to reopen in the fall of 1861 due to the departure of all but three of the students and most of the faculty, Barnard resigned and began to travel back north. His travel was delayed behind the war front, so he and his wife spent the winter in Roanoke before finally arriving in Washington in May of 1862. There, he combined his engineering, astronomical, surveying, and printing skills to prepare the coastal and war maps for the Union effort in the United States. Still adaptable to the social, temporal, and geographical circumstances, and though a slave owner when he had lived in Alabama and Mississippi, once he was in Washington in 1863, Barnard published a 32-page open letter to the President of the United States by a refugee, offering a sweeping com condemna condemnation of slavery in the South. This letter from a Northern academic who had spent 
20 years in the South, a refugee, exhorted the president to follow through on the promise of the Emancipation Proclamation and to prosecute the war less as an effort to maintain the Union and more to abolish slavery. The next year, a position opened uh, as chair of physics at Columbia College, and the holder of that chair had left to fight for the Confederacy. And so Barnard applied for that position. And when the Columbia Board of Trustees saw his application and put together this fellow who had written this very persuasive letter to the president, they offered him, instead of the chair, they offered him the presidency of the college. So Barnard became the 10th president of Columbia College, leading it to university status, growing it from 150 students to 1,500 students, and he focused scientific and professional learning opportunities to both undergraduate and graduate students. He was president of Columbia for 25 years, from 1864 until 1888, and when he died the next year in 1889, he left most of his state after the death of his wife, Margaret, to Columbia. Having been a lifelong advocate of co-education, never separate education for men and women, he, he uh, is, it's ironic and appropriate at the same time that when Columbia University decided to form a women's college that year, the year that he died, they named it Barnard College, and it's still all women, um, although they have classes together. Uh, so there's Barnard College right across the street from, uh, from Columbia College. Um, Barnard's uh, completed observatory began its history serving dramatically different functions from those that he had envisioned. During the Civil War, the building was used as a hospital for soldiers, both Confederate and Union. Its nearby companion building, the Magnetic Observatory, was deployed as a morgue and rechristened dead house. Later, it was demolished. Uh, much of Oxford was burned during the Civil War, but Barnard Observatory was spared. General William Tecumseh Sherman and Barnard were colleagues. Sherman was a West Point graduate and was president of the military college that became LSU when the war began. After Sherman traveled through Oxford when it was burned by General A.J., uh, as we call him in Oxford, Whiskey Smith, he wrote Barnard a letter saying, I assure you that last November, when I rode through the grounds of the college in Oxford, I thought of you, thought I saw the traces of your life in the observatory of which I remember you spoke. After the war, Barnard could not complete the purchase of the Alvin Clark lens that Barnard had commissioned. Clark sold it to the highest bidder which was the Chicago Astronomical Society. They installed it in the Dearborn Observatory in Chicago and later to its successor facility in Evanston. Uh, nonetheless, the University of Mississippi did purchase and install a somewhat more modest telescope and Barnard Observatory functioned as designed with research and teaching facilities in the western and center portions of the building while the east wing was used as a residence for the senior astronomy or other science faculty member and his family. By 1907, the East Wing had been de designated as the Chancellor's home, and from then until 1971, as many as 15 chancellors lived there with their families. In 1939, the university opened a new physics building and a new observatory, and so they moved out of uh, Barnard. In 47, the Western academic portions of the building became home to the Naval ROTC and was rechristened McCain Hall in honor of a former student from Carrollton, Mississippi and the grandfather of Senator John McCain. Um, 
there was another intervening, the, the, the intervening generation also made Admiral, Mc, the, the McCain of, of our memory was just, um, he's just a lowly senator and war hero. Um, after 1971, when the university acquired a new chancellor's home, Barnard's East Wing was used intermittently, primarily for a series of sororities until 1977, when it became home to the university's new Center for the Study of Southern Culture. The center's first permanent director was selected in 78 and arrived on campus in 79. It was, of course, William Ferris. You all, all know him, the Grammy Award winning uh, rock star of uh, academia and popular folklore. Um, but he was also recruited from Yale University where he was uh, teaching. Um, he had also been on the faculty at Jackson State University. Um, so once again, Barnard was occupied by another scholar from Yale, this one uh, an observer of regional culture instead of astronomy. By the time Ferris came to Ole Miss, Barnard Observatory was the worst for wear. The center was given one wing of the building that was entirely in disrepair, and the larger portion was used by the Naval ROTC, which may have been even harder use. Um, Bill Ferris insisted that the Center for the Study of Southern Culture was going to accomplish great things and that they needed the whole building. Uh, Chancellor Porter Fortune told Ferris that if he could raise the money to renovate it, he could have the whole building. And within a few years, Bill, with the assistance of longtime assistant director Ann Abity, succeeded in landing a $600,000 challenge grant from the NEH to preserve Barnard Observatory. And finally, the, the, uh, with the help of a lot of private individuals and state money, the center raised, succeeded in reaching the $3 million uh, mark to renovate the building. In the year before my final year of architecture school, I was casting about for a, um, a subject for a design thesis and visiting um, Oxford. Um, I talked to Bill, I became familiar with what was going on with the center um, and with the building. So I, I thought this would be great. I'll, I'll do a hypothetical addition to Barnard Observatory, presuming that it was already in a restored um, condition. And I'll even deign to show you all some of the work, student work I did 40 years ago, so, <laughs> or almost 40 years ago, 30 years ago. No, it was 40 years ago. So by the time the center and the university had raised their match, it was 1986, and I had completed my architecture internship, become licensed, and had recently joined some more senior architects as a partner in Mock P. Coker Howorth, and our office was right over here on the next block. Um, based largely on my extensive knowledge of the building, we were selected to execute the rehabilitation of Barnard Observatory. And once we were hired, one of the major challenges was to define the scope of the project and how it would be best performed in accordance with what are, we all know as the Secretary of Interior standards for the treatment of historic properties. Um, the building over time had acquired all sorts of additions. Some of them were terrible and some were worse. <laughs> and some were, whether they were good or bad, quite beloved, uh, particularly the double galleries that had been added to the East Wing, excuse me, East Wing during its early services, the Chancellor's Home. certainly makes it more livable. Um, the architects made the argument that the building's exterior, despite the age and the appeal of a few of these additions, should be restored to its 19th century appearance. The building had to function as a modern home to the center, uh, 
but we believe that its enduring significance was its earliest aspirations, Barnard's aspirations for the building and for the university and for the state. So we began to pitch our recommendation up the chain of command, first to Bill Ferris, then to the chancellor, Gerald Turner then, and finally to the Department of Archives and History. Whew, boy, talk about a tough sale. Um, the, you know, the Archives and History, the SHPO, of course, is, you know, these additions had become a part of the fabric of the building. So it, it, uh, there was a strong, um, strong case for keeping these. Um, on the other hand, uh, preserving these bad additions would have taxed our budget and diverted funds that weren't really necessary to save the core building. Also, once we preserve them, they would need to be maintained over their extended usable life. Of course, this is an argument that perpetually frustrates preservationists is that, and, and, and a condition that demolition is so damn cheap. Uh, in this case, we argued, wouldn't it be better to demolish the ill-conceived poorly designed and under-constructed additions and focus our res resources on a really excellent building. You can see the uh, infill in the rear portico, an addition off of one of the connecting links to the, between the tall pavilions and the, the one-story links, the condition of the porches that were, in some cases, original and other cases added. Here's the infill. And here are some examples of the condition. And, you know, I'll point out the window here and the, the you know, sort of eave to wall condition. Uh, I don't know how, obviously nobody drew that. Um, but pragmatic arguments seldom win debates, um, these debates. But it was un incontrovertible that even the Habs photographer had, by selection of his shots, edited out the building's worst parts. Uh, that in itself was a statement of their insignificance. So if you look, you, you can see the, the, the gallery but you can't see any of those other things that I just showed you on the back side. And, and the consistency of, of restoration or preservation, uh, what time period were we going for, we couldn't sort of edit what we did. It was all or nothing. Um, so this is what we went back to. Um, and you can see here conditions similar, these transits, uh, were opened all the way through the roof. Uh, there were embellishments that were documented in historical photographs. We were fortunate that Dr. Boyington, one of the faculty members, was an early photographer in the 1850s. So there were very early photo photographs of the building. I've shown you a couple of them. Um, We restored the building's five-part Palladian fan, uh, plan to its sub substantially symmetrical south-facing facade, but the symmetry here is, is sort of, it's, they're, they're sort of, I would argue, modern uh, interpretations because the two-story wing here with the intermediate floor is built this way, whereas the tall one has got the pilasters that you saw at, uh, at the University of Alabama, which is, that's one of the details that I say makes it look like the uh, Barnard had a hand in it. But, you know, he could have simply thickened the whole wall or articulated those pilasters on the interior of the building. Um, so, what did we do? This was the plan before the restoration. We had the big addition out the back, which you saw this window to wall, the eave to wall condition is right there. This was the infilled 
uh, rear portico and the extension off the back side. Um, and then of course, these are the galleries. This was the back porch, which you saw with plastic all around it. Uh, and this was what the ROTC had done with the interior of the lecture hall. And you'll notice that there's a, conveniently a stair. So they had inserted a second floor within that tall lecture hall space. So um, we were able to lose a bunch of square footage, but make the building revert back to its pure original condition. Very nearly so. I don't think there was a bathroom here. Um, and so this, this is what we did in plan. We adapted the uh, rear gallery to conceal a handicap ramp. The handicap parking is right over here, so that's the most proximate entrance that they can get there. This is pre-ADA, uh, so we, we were not quite as constrained as we would be uh, today uh, to negotiate the conflicting requirements of historic preservation and uh, the Americans with Disabilities Act. But this was uh, what it looked like mid-construction. Um, I apologize for the quality of my scanned 35 millimeter slides. Um, and this is what it looks like now from largely the same perspective. And this was on the east side after we removed the, the gallery and there were some holes in the wall where they had notched the structure in. Um, and that's the after picture of that. And this was the addition off the back side on the west side of the building, a uh, two-story addition that went along with the two-story conversion of the lecture hall. Removing that opened up the back of the building and we restored the, visually we restored the gallery here, but there's a handicap ramp that goes behind there. Um, you can see that ramp. And the interior. You can see a little bit of the banding where the floor was going across. Uh, this was a tour during the, the construction period, once when we opened it up. Which space is that? That's the Tupelo room. That's the lecture hall. And there's Ted Owenby giving a lecture. Hey, Ted. And another seminar. So uh, with that, I'll be happy to answer whatever questions I can. Yes, sir. He's coming behind you with a microphone. Since you mentioned um, Dr. Ted Ornby, and um, just want to mention that Dr. Ted Ornby was the chairman of my committee. And um, his office is within walking distance from the observatory. And um, I just want to let Dr. impress Dr. Ornby that his efforts were not in vain. I'm going to ask a question. Um, you mentioned something about a letter of 32 pages that um, Dr. Bernard wrote to the president. I was wondering about what caused him to write the letter, what effect or impact did the letter have on the president? Did it influence his, his decisions in any way? I, I would have to defer on that 
last question to somebody who knows more about presidential histories and what effect that might have had on Lincoln and how that, uh, how that might have changed the war effort. Um, but it was specifically cited as one of the reasons that the Board of Trustees at Columbia College decided that, that, that Barnard was presidential material and not, not the head of the physics department. Um, and, you know, obviously he served 25 years and Columbia fared okay during that period. So, so I think they were right. <clears throat> it's hard to imagine what Barnard's thinking was as he went from his upbringing in New, e New England and his education in New England and getting to Alabama where the mores and values were so different and carrying that over to Mississippi and then moving, uh, moving to Washington during the Civil War, I can imagine all sorts of motivations for why he would write that letter. Um, but it's all conjectural. Uh, and, and I'd like to imagine uh, uh, met motives that accrue to his benefit. But if somebody else knows more about uh, Lincoln's reaction, Ted, <laughs> be happy to hear him. Yes. Uh, the building itself. Uh, thanks. On the building itself, tell us about the windows in the drum on top of the central structure. All, all of the windows were, had to be rebuilt uh, for the building. They had all been previously replaced. Um, and the, the ones on the drum uh, are they're, they're uh, single unit fixed windows. So the only opening that works, that worked there was of course the, the telescope opening. So you could, you could ventilate that space very effectively. Uh, I think the, the windows were not necessary. Um, it's just, if you're gonna build that space, why not illuminate it? Of course, you realize when you're looking at that space, that the floor is down here, okay? So that volume, you know, you can go back to the shot I had a couple, a few back here, shows the volume here uh, of uh, up there. So that, those windows, the sills of those windows are probably about 10 feet above the floor. And the heads of those windows, that, that space is probably 20, 22 feet high, something like that. Any other questions? And the Southern, the Southern Center is still there. The Center for the Study of Southern Culture is still there. They're, uh, they're not all housed there. I think they're scattered in some other places on, on the campus. There's some satellite operations. Ted, Ted knows more about this than I do. They haven't built my thesis project yet. That's, that's. <laughs> still looking for a donor. <laughs> right. What, what do you say? The, the space, this the space right there is occupied by the Southern Foodways Alliance. So that's a, that's a, a circle inscribed in a square. So there's one of the, of the corners that's, that's, between them is the, where the stairway comes up. The other three are tiny little offices. Uh, and then there's a pool of open space, but you know, it's, it's mainly open space. Is it still open like this and they have put a floor in between? No, there's not a, we didn't, we didn't insert a floor here. It's a, it's a one story space. So, so you go up the main stair to where, uh, to where the SFA is, and um, and it's just one floor, but they have a great volume, and they have little workstations in there, so it's still one big open space. <laughs>
Yeah, no question. Tom, did, did Barnard maintain any Mississippi relationships or ever come back to the state after he left? I don't know of any trips he ever made here. He made a, a, a lot of scientific ex, explorations. You know, he was doing, um, and I don't know enough about uh, the physics of astronomy at that time and the relationship between astronomy and surveying. And but he was he he was very much involved in exploration. And you know, it was a, it was a it was a great time for um, for scientific growth, mainly because there were so many advances in instrumentation, measurement, uh, the precision that uh, that we were capable of, and 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 the be, to be able to sort of produce scientific instruments rapidly and distribute them across the world. A huge communications and scientific network in the mid 19th century that had not been the people had not been capable of before then. In the original design, was the drum stationary? Would it would it rotate or anything? No, Any? it, it would rotate. We didn't we didn't uh, we didn't restore that characteristic of it. But the track is still there, uh, and the, the dome still sits on the track. It, it's an interesting geometry in that it, it transitions from a, from a square to an octagon to, uh, to a circle, and that's sort of uh, representing the, the logical ways to build out of masonry versus wood. Um, in, in, in doing that, and also carrying those loads. And also the, the, the central pier, of course, was isolated structurally from the rest of the building so that footfall vibrations wouldn't be transferred ultimately into the telescope. So that, uh, it's, it's, the telescope was designed to, to, the pier that mounted the telescope was designed to be isolated from everything else. Yes. That's the round thing at the bottom. Yeah. What's the question? If that's the pier. That the telescope ultimately set on. That was that was uh, one question I was going to ask. The, the other, the the telescope that the university ultimately. Purchased is it in the, the museum you mentioned with all of no uh, that telescope was moved to the Kennan Observatory when when it was built in 1940 did I say seven or nine it was it, it, it was moved in 47 I believe uh, and then um, I presume that that telescope is still in the Kennan Observatory which is not the observatory that the university uses for, for real science anymore. It's, you know, they've got one out by Sardis where, oh, where there's less light. Okay. One other question that uh, I was curious about it, with his uh, deafness, how did, how did that affect his, or it seemed like it didn't affect his career uh, on as a president of a major university and I, I wondered whether it affected uh, Yale's decision to, um, you know, you know, he's not only an Episcopalian, but he's deaf. Uh, he, he's going deaf, and <laughs> the, the, you know, and the last thing a president or dean wants is faculty member who, who really can't hear, not just won't listen, um, <laughs> but um, so. So he, um, you know, but he did. He thrived, and he had um, a, a cumbersome big listening device in his office that, you know, to try to amplify what noise that he could. But he was clearly uh, a man of rare intelligence, and um, 
He had learned sign language. I don't know whether he learned to lip read, um, but he, he managed to understand and communicate very effectively. Uh, and, you know, but it, it makes sense to me that he might have, Alabama might have been settling for him based on, you know, what he thought at, at, as, a, as a young faculty member who, of, of whom there are many, you know, available, um, that might not have been the ideal choice for him. Uh, but it was the ideal choice for him at the time because, in fact, from, from one of the anecdotes that I read in doing research was that he had met the president of the uh, University of Alabama on a train going back from New Haven having not been hired. And, he, you know, he, here you are getting rejected from one job and you get on the train and somebody offers you the next one, looks like an, a sign to me. And, um, you know, so I, I, but I don't know, I'm speculating. Um. Any other questions? Um, are there any good biographies of Barnard? I, I didn't find one now, but I think there's, there's, uh, there's going to be one. Uh, I'm not writing it. It's going to be written by a real scholar. Um, who, who is that writing it? Uh, is uh, Meacham, is she writing? Yeah. She's, she's just starting to do research. Um, um, she, she called me when I was starting to do my research. I'll, I'll share my amateurish notes with her. Uh, and are there lots of papers of his? Well, you know, that was one of the things that, you know, when I was, when we were doing this project, of course, there was no internet. And uh, so, so I didn't uh, go spend a lot of time at libraries, and I didn't go seek out any primary source material. Uh, there, there are some academic papers. Um, there are some master's theses, some of which I got access to, not all of them. Some of them were behind, uh, behind paywalls that not being a scholar myself, I don't, I don't have access to. Um, and the, uh, the, the, uh, I found out a lot. And many years ago, when we were working on this project, um, we, you know, the resources were, were very meager. Um, you know, but the internet, there's a lot of material online, uh, and, and fortunately there's not a lot of, there's not a lot of trash online because the people who are writing about Frederick Barnard are fairly serious, mostly scholars. Um, and so the material is footnoted, it's, um, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's an interesting I, I think it'll be a great book uh, when, when she writes it, when Ellen writes it. We've come to the top of another hour. I'm sure Tom will be glad to answer any further questions you may have afterwards. I hope that we'll see you all back here Saturday for Michael Cotman and next week for Akola Rashid. But for now, help me thank Tom for this fabulous program today.